Hello everybody and welcome back to Xenonauts. Uh, I am recording this part and the previous part, uh, not necessarily back to back or recorded about a day apart, but you know, more or less back to back. Um, so last part, B team didn't do so hot. They, you know, lost like roughly a third of their squad uh, or team rather. Uh, in their very first engagement. So, yeah. I'm going to get my timer started. And, uh, well, let's hope that they have better luck next time when they do get sent out again, eventually. The Alien Plasma Rifle is a two-handed alien infantry weapon approximately 30 inches in length and 3 kilometers, er, not kilometers, 3 kilograms in weight. It is a vastly more capable combat weapon than the Alien Plasma Pistol, generating a plasma bolt that is significantly more powerful and cohesive than its smaller cousin. Without the space constraints of the Plasma Pistol, the aliens have mounted a more substantial generation array inside the weapon's barrel. This gives it a similar operational range to most ballistic assault rifles, but far higher damage and armor penetration potential. Laboratory tests suggest jackal combat armor may do just enough to allow the wearer to survive a direct hit, but unarmed or excuse me, but unarmored troops would likely be killed instantly. Indeed, we believe this weapon is even a credible threat to our hunter armored cars. It would appear that the versatility of the alien plasma rifle makes it the default armament for alien combatants. It is powerful, light, accurate, and capable of burst fire. In short, vastly superior to anything we possess. And that gives us alien plasma technology, which we can then research to get uh, laser weapons. But um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hold out on that just just a little bit. I mean, I would love to. I would love to get that. I really would, but we. For one, don't have the funds to even start attempting to equip our troops with laser weapons right this second. So we're going to go ahead and focus on some of the other techs right now. Okay, Central America got uh, the three extra soldiers that were needed to replace some of the guys that died. Um, and... Yet again, none of them meet the requirements. But let's go ahead and uh, look into here. So strength. Who has a lot of strength? You do. Well then, you're a shield person. Uh, you have a lot of reflex. You have a lot of reflex. And the rest of you can stay a rifleman. That is perfectly acceptable to me. Admittedly, it should be noted that uh, you guys don't quite have enough for a full team right now. Um... How long is uh, Dieter going to be out for, if the game will tell me? Uh, game actually won't tell me, because Dieter is not technically, I guess, in the med bay? Yeah, because that has eight beds. Well, it claims there are three people there. And the only damaged people are Carmen, Dieter, and Jakob. Also, I thought... I thought Carmen died. I don't recall her getting revived. I really don't. Uh, but apparently she was, but she's not in this list because, yeah. She was revived, clearly, since she's not in this list. But, you know, took significant damage that we can't even theoretically add her to our uh, loadout. Okay, we got one more Jackal armor here, but I'm pretty sure this team is all set up, right? For the actual team. The reserves are not quite. We need three more, well, two more in total for the reserves. And that's all our money and alien alloys. Alien technology is founded on a variety of exotic materials, every one of which possesses remarkable properties. We have identified materials with tensile strength and heat resistance in order of magnitude greater than anything previous known, as well as those with more exotic properties such as room temperature superconductivity. Almost all of them are ultra-advanced ceramics with a chemical structure as alien as the extraterrestrials themselves. 
Though we have yet to encounter any unknown fundamental element in these materials, we have little idea how they generate their extraordinary powers or how they could be manufactured. It is the difference between coal and diamond, fundamentally the same stuff, but radically different in practice. Given their exceptional heat resistance, the most obvious military application of these alloys would be in personal battlefield armor. Unfortunately, they are so effective at dissipating heat that anything in our laboratory can generate or that nothing in our laboratory can generate enough to melt them, making fabrication of a plate of armor or anything else a little more than a pipe dream. Though still effectively useless, we are harvesting these alloys from recovered artifacts where possible. The aliens must have the means to shape these materials, so further study of their technology may allow us to do the same. Uh, let's go ahead and get those Alenium Explosives right now, game. Thank you very much. No, oh, game. God, game, like, stuttered. Okay, this is a, uh, a fighter. We'll send the Condors for that one. Wonderful. I think you guys have enough ammo to take care of that. Uh, we're not going to send the B team because the B team is not ready to go. Uh, as was very clearly evident last time. So we're going to go ahead, because this is a small UFO, not a very small, uh, we're going to go ahead and have the A team make its very long trek across the Atlantic to, uh, oh, what is this? El Salvador? Looks like it. Yeah, um, maybe not El Salvador, I can't really tell. It's, it's in that region at least, but it may not actually be El Salvador itself. That's a fighter. Return to base. Uh, it might be Nicar Nicaragua. I'm really, I can't really tell, because, you know... Borders aren't really drawn here. So I can make a guess. Okay, that one looks to have left. We're gonna get a day battle, just barely. So these guys have the jackal armor, which helps a little bit. It's not a significant... It really isn't. I, I, it's not significant, especially when you're dealing with the uh, alien rifles, but it is still beneficial. And the game is taking a while to load. It took forever to load up. When I started it, and it's taken forever to get the combat loaded. Oh, okay. You step over here. Or as you can tell, there's nothing there. That is more than likely incorrect. Okay. Um, I guess 4, 5, and 6 are going to head out to the warehouse, and 1, 2, and 3 are going to head into the forest. I, again, because the UFO tends to spawn in the opposite corner from where you are, uh, typically it's like straight opposite, but sometimes it's not, uh, 1, 2, and 3 are going to be the ones more than likely heading straight for the UFO. Depends a little bit on exactly how the pathing to get there works, because I think we're going to have to run along the track here. Just don't really want to. I can avoid it because... That's not a great spot to try and set up. Whoops, you are... Oh no, no, you were the right person, never mind. Never mind. I was uh, reading the numbers incorrectly. 
you are in fact the right person for that job. Oops, that did not quite path how I wanted it to because I wasn't paying too much attention. Okay, Giel is going to go ahead and run up to the cart here. Oh, I think we found the UFO. That fire there, as we've observed, is generally the location of the UFO, so I think it might actually be really close to us, which is weird. That, that can't possibly be the actual UFO, because that's way too freaking close to us. He is in a terrible spot. If he had moved out a little bit more, I could have gotten Lewis into where he's standing. Which would have been great, but sadly he is... He's not quite blocking our ability to get by, but he is not in the best position. Yeah, I, I want to say that that's not actually the UFO right there. Like, it's, it can't be right on the opposite side here. That's just way too close. I've never had a UFO. Even these small ones spawn that close. Okay, well, we know where one is. Can you even make it through here? No, you can't, because you can't knock down the trees. Yeah, this is not a great map for... Uh, that should be a decent spot. We know he's, like, around the corner here. I don't think he has the time units to make it all the way around this corner. So Inga should be fine to go right here next to the propane tank. As long as it doesn't get shot. Which, speaking of that, we're going to have the hunter move a little bit further out so that if it does decide to reaction fire on the alien, because maybe he does have the time units to make it here, uh, his shots should not go far enough and hit the propane tank. Lucy's going to be watching the double doors here because I don't know if there's another entrance on the other side. Game, did you actually spawn the UFO that close? You did. I swear that is way too close. Oh, fuck. Well, uh, Tabor is going to be in the uh, infirmary because... You know, I might have accidentally sent him into the fire, because normally I would have thought that the game was smart enough to say, wait, you're trying to send him into fire, you know, even if he gets, if the fire becomes spotted after you order the move. But evidently that wasn't the case this time. Okay, we got a civvy. Okay, there was not another way in. So... He is still somewhere on the other side there. Lucy is going to watch where that civ is, or where that police officer. Ah, uh, Tabor, where the hell are you? Can't see you in the fire. I'm going to send you all the way around. We know he's back there. Oh, he went to that building, didn't he? Nope. 
Wonderful, but I don't think I have the time units to get over there and shoot him, so we're not going to be doing that. Uh, Inga, step back a little bit. Serve as a human shield with a ballistic shield in front of you, of course. Uh, for Giela here. This guy does have the... He should be able to move a little bit. So we'll see what he does. He's going to shoot and miss. Which I'm fine with. Now I can push up. I would like to push up enough to be able to fire twice, which I was a little bit shy, actually. There we go. That gets rid of you. I'm... I'm going to assume that this officer came from this building. We did see that an alien, presumably this guy, shot at somebody down this street. So I'm going to assume that this officer came out here, the alien shot at him, and this guy just kept running towards our helicopter. That's going to be my assumption. Oh, fucking civilians blocking you. There's a dude in that building. Um. Well, I don't have anybody with a weapon with enough range to really take care of you. I mean, Tabor can take a shot. He's got a half-decent chance of hitting. Uh, not enough time yet to make that throw. Slightly out of range. That's presumably not going to kill you because I think that's too far away. Oh, he's way the hell up there. Uh, I want to assume that we suppressed him enough that he's not going to be poking his head out again this turn. Or next turn. That blocks you. Well, that did damage. And he runs back inside. It's fine with me. There we go. This thing has plenty of ammo, so I have no problem just using it to spray down a building. Okay, so we're gonna move around the edge here. Presumably the last guys are inside, so we're not going to spend too much time attempting to cover our flank. You, you can. Wonderful. Run across. Because I'm going to try and get you on the left side of the door here.
these guys can take damage from smoke inhalation so we do want to try and avoid if at all possible standing in smoke at the end of a turn okay, go back to the other side of the oh shit fucking fire Okay. Now we know there's like at least three in there would seem to be the likely uh, conclusion that we can draw. I can get some of my guys up to the door, but I can't quite get all of them, so I'm gonna hold off for another turn. In fact, Tabor actually probably can't make it there, period. I just I think he just does not have the time units to make that. No, he doesn't. Okay. Uh Tabor. We're going to have you. The way out on the flank. Next turn, I think you'll have the time units to make it. Or at least get even closer. Okay. Um, I would love to get the vehicle here, but it's... Not really possible, sadly. I'd have to spend a bunch of turns trying to blow up the trees and whatnot to get here. And that's just not worth it. Uh, we're going to actually have these guys crouch because being crouched does decrease the chance of you being hit. Even if presumably there's nothing actually blocking the alien from getting a shot into you. There's three more in there. Two more in there. Oh no, still three more in there. We're probably going to lose you. Yep. Inga's down. Not a surprise. These last two guys, however... Tabor should be able to open the door. Damn, you didn't die in one shot. Oh, Inga, there's still one more dude, apparently. Okay. Let's get the uh, rifle guys in. Um, I don't know how badly you're bleeding. And I don't think I have the ability to get Lewis over there to heal you. I'm hopeful it's only one... Really hopeful it's only one. Because the game doesn't sadly tell me and I wasn't actually paying attention when the pop-up was there. <sighs> yeah, he fell. And then, you know, can't, uh... Okay, so he should only be at, what, negative one health, so there's a half-decent chance Tabor will be revived. Because I don't think bleeding out actually completely prevents you from being revived. So that's both our shield guys down. Which kind of hurts. Okay... Oh, he's not looking in this direction. Come on, Tabor. Oh, is the last one not in here? Or we cannot see him because of all the damn smoke. 
Uh, last one may not be in here. So if I can just hold this, we win. Yeah, it looks like, uh... He's somewhere outside. So we just need to hold this for five turns, I believe it is. Something like that. God damn. Game locking up on me for whatever reason. You know, eventually the game normally will just show you where the last guy is. But I don't recall how long that actually takes. So I think we're going to win the countdown just from owning this room. Or having secured the UFO. There we go. Mission successful. Damn, Tabor wasn't able to be revived. Neither was Inga, so we lost both our shield people. Uh, but Jules was promoted to a major. Uh, and all the survivors earned the service medal for active participation in 10 combat missions. And Giela also earned the Order of Merit for eliminating 10 extraterrestrials. Of course, I now need to hire two more people, and we're going to go ahead and actually just focus on people with strength. And Alenium Explosives. The majority of Alenium found inside wrecked UFOs has been run through the vessel's reactor, making it of little use as a fuel. The low-grade Alenium only contains enough power to run the extra or er, excuse me, to run an extraterrestrial device for a few minutes, whereas fresh Alenium can do so for hours at a time. However, it turns out there is another use of this relatively abundant low-grade alenium. Explosives. The amount of energy held in depleted alenium is usually still appreciably higher than is contained in the equivalent weight of TNT. My team has therefore been able to produce improved designs of the high-explosive rockets and grenades issued to our soldiers, replacing the explosives with an alenium charge that is up to 50% more powerful than conventional munitions. Given the ample availability of the constituent parts, these can be manufactured and issued to our soldiers in effectively unlimited numbers. Your men seem impressed. They spent so long testing the new device that the firing range required, required structural repairs. The principle behind these devices is simple. The explosive is a block of alenium that dumps all its energy into the surrounding air when triggered. The warhead on the rocket is sufficiently large that this will generate a sizable explosion. But the grenade also employs a steel casing that fragments into a deadly cloud of metal shards on detonation. However, be aware these weapons will inflict as much damage on extraterrestrial equipment as on the aliens themselves. Aliens killed with explosives are unlikely to leave a corpse behind, let alone recoverable items. And then of course, Alenium Warheads. So the low-grain alenium can also be used to upgrade the missiles carried by our interceptors. This process was slightly more involved as our anti-air warheads rely on armor penetration as much as explosive force. Nonetheless, we have been successful. And as the new warheads can be fitted in eh, can be fitted to our existing rocket engines, we have already upgraded our interceptors accordingly. The required armor penetration is achieved by fitting a small laser emitter on to the top of the alenium block. This fires in a predetermined pattern, which can be chart can be changed to allow us to shape and focus the explosive change or the explosive charge in any direction that we choose. With no time to conduct extensive studies on the effectiveness of different charge patterns, we instead just ensure that the energy from the blast is focused forwards rather than wastefully radiating in all directions. Crude, perhaps, but certainly functional. The Alenium Missile is a direct replacement for the Sidewinder Light Air-to-Air -air Missile, whilst the Alenium Torpedo replaces the Heavy Avalanche Torpedo. The latter is a powerful weapon, well suited to dealing with lumbering alien craft without the speed or agility to avoid it. The former, a faster missile that inflicts less damage but is more likely to hit alien, to hit alien lighter vessels. 
I would have said lighter alien vessels, but whatever. Uh, in, both case, mo in both cases, the upgrades are just straightforward warhead swaps, so this should not dictate any major change in aerial tactics beyond making our engagements a little easier. So, okay, we now have better uh, missiles and torpedoes that we haven't messed with the torpedoes at all. Technically, I can send the Foxtrots out with Alenium missiles. Uh, I don't. There's, like, no reason to do that, realistically. Uh, two Condors does more than enough, generally speaking. A two soldiers arrived at the North Africa base. Uh, I don't actually recall which one it is, but I'm going to assume it's going to be these privates, obviously. I just don't necessarily recall which of these privates is the one in, or are the ones in question. So there we go. Uh, we st we have three jackal armor, which is enough to finish kitting out everybody here. Uh, obviously, there's a few reasons why I go with ten people. One because that's the starting number, uh, but also because if we get attacked, I'd rather have ten people as well as however many vehicles. Uh, I think it caps out at two vehicles even though your garage has a total of space for three vehicles. I generally don't have more than two vehicles, however, at a base, so. Okay, and we're out of money. Again. Small UFO. Uh, and that one's medium. And that's another small. So we have our first medium uh, alien vessel. Um, tail until overland. There we go. The Corvette. Obviously, we're going to be relying on the Foxtrot for this kill, and I will, of course, show off uh, one. Did not mean to tell you to do a combat roll. Actually, it's very slow turning, so I think I can get the Foxtrot to fire its missiles. There we go. Now, thing is, you do not have any ability to engage properly. No, no, no. You're getting the hell out of there. Oh, wrong one. Condor 2 is the one I'm trying to select. I really wish the game would label these things in a better way. Now, of course, these guys have the smaller Sidewinder replacements, so... I'm relying on... The fact that he is currently focused on Condor 1 for Condor 2 to swoop in from behind and fire a couple missiles up the ass. There we go. So, looks like it takes two Foxtrot, or, well, a Foxtrot, so two of the, uh, Lenium Torpedoes and two, well, maybe only one. Didn't really, you know, bother to test that. Uh, Alenium Missiles. Obviously, I will not be actually fighting those going forward because I just generally don't bother. I'll be fighting one for some of these things, maybe not all of them, but, you know, some of them, uh, just to show off each of the alien vehicle or uh, UFOs, but beyond that, I do not personally care to actually uh, fight each of the air engagements. It's just way too much. Now, my timer's going to go off before this mission finishes. This is a Corvette. There's a lot more aliens. And, uh... We're a little bit behind from where I would like to be, if I'm being honest. So, 
So, but this is going to end up being a longer part. I could have, you know, cut this short, but decided not to. Still about 10 minutes. Okay, and that looks to be the edge of the map over there. Actually, you go there on that side of the door. Of course, because this is a larger UFO, will also give us more money for completing it. Which would be great, because we need the money. Oh, we got these guys. Fuck. Okay, so these are the little robot dudes. The ones that somebody was, you know, telling me that, hey, you know, you're probably going to want to use rockets. Again, I don't use rockets. Two shotgun blasts to the face, get the job done. It's not quite the same when it comes to using your rifles, of course, but they get the job done well enough. And we found the UFO. This one, luckily, is only a two, though there is sort of an airlock. Uh, you are suppressed, so there is an alien somewhere out here. I can't see him, but there is an alien somewhere out there. That much is obvious. Oh, Veronica, you are going to take forever to get around. Hopefully you see him. Oh, he's way out there. Okay. Sadly, it looks like these none of these guys are armed. Oh, it's that thing. And you missed. Okay, pull back. I'd rather I shoot at the civilian than you. That's the main reason why you're pulling back. Let's go ahead and push up with Terry here. And get Lucia to push up on the other side. Can't quite see that well over there, so there could be something there. There may be nothing there. Can't really tell. Looks like nothing is the most likely uh, scenario. Uh, where are you seeing something? Oh, way out there. Okay. That's fine. He's far enough out. We can ignore him for right this second. What do I want to do with Lewis here, though? Okay, civilian died. In theory, that guy, or the little floating disc thing, should push up. Or, you know, at least be a little bit more inclined to do so. No, it looks like it fell back. Yes, it fell back. I had a higher chance to hit this time around. We're going to go ahead and run around the corner, however. That way he doesn't shoot us. You go ahead and double check that there's nothing back here. Wonderful. Lucy's going to take cover there. Terry's going to take cover over here. This does not have a... Oh, it might, it might actually have a breach on the other side. That's... We're going to ignore that breach. In that case. Uh, Terry, I would really like to actually have you head in here. Of course, that's not your specialty, so I'm going to tell Jules here to make the long run.
He's in that room. There we go. There's still one dude out here. Although he might have gone back inside if that is in fact a breach there. Which I think is... Yep, that is in fact a breach, so he probably actually went back inside the UFO. Uh, no, that's not actually the one I was wanting to send there. Um... Go the long way around. By long way, I mean the safe way. Yeah, I think he went back inside. That just seems the most likely scenario. Okay. Uh, kind of forgot about Giello over there. Gonna have her move up. Usually I'd have the shotgun dudes, but they're not quite in the right spot to move into position there. Okay, there's a dude right at the breach there watching. Which one is for you, Giela? Veronica is the one for you. Damn, that's actually a decent sized breach. Well, I say that, it really isn't, it's just part of it's broken elsewhere. Damn, got real lucky there. Triple resist. Uh, broke the wall behind him. What was that? Missed. Missed. go. Close the door again. Giel is going to reload. She's low on ammo. In that, uh... God, I'm really not happy that you destroyed the wall portion there. That actually really hurts me. Because normally I would have, in this case, Veronica move to where that guy was standing when we destroyed the wall behind him. The reason of which I hope is fairly obvious. I typically, you know, somewhat symmetrical formations. But I can't really do that. So we're going to go with a slightly asymmetric formation instead. Okay. Not uh, particularly clean. Jules is down, which sucks. And he wasn't able to be revived. Fuck. Uh, uh, who was that that got those kills? I'm gonna. Well, the only one who got any kills at all was Giela. So Giela, I was kind of hoping she would reaction fire and shoot the guys because I knew somebody was gonna eventually walk through one of those doors. That's why I set up there. 
And I typically set up my shield guys in on opposite sides of the of the corner there, opposite of the main entrance. So that they can open the doors so that the people in the center can shoot. If I want to go ahead and try and shoot the enemy that turn, instead of waiting for them to hopefully come to me in reaction fire. So sadly, Giela... Giela screwed up and he got Jul Julis killed. Or Julie's? I don't know. She got the major killed because she did not reaction fire. I mean, she probably wouldn't have killed either of them with one shot, realistically. But it would have been something. It would have been something. You know, maybe if she got really lucky, she would have killed one. And then only one of them would have gotten shots on Jules. But... Oh well, Jules died. He got a kill before dying. And then Giela finished everything else up and got a promotion to captain for it. Uh, Louis and Lucia both got promoted to major. Oh, we're not researching anything. I, I fucked up. <laughs> I did not realize that I forgot to set research again. So, whoops. Of course, that, this also means I need now to buy one more guy. And that's pretty usual. I normally buy somebody with reflex. Um, and that means I need a new assault. So. Who here thinks they have the expertise necessary to be an assault? Well, Irina... Didn't we have another Irina that was shield? Apparently we had two Irinas, I think. Because I could have sworn we had an Irina who died. No, it was an Inga. Never mind. Uh, you guys can stay riflemen. I don't typically change people's roles after I've assigned them one, or at least I try to avoid it. So, Sophie here. Uh, yeah, Sophie, you're going to be... Taking an assault role to replace poor old Lewis who died. And actually, speaking of, just double checking. Yeah, no, we don't have, we still don't have somebody to replace. Well, not to replace, but to name. And we, I, we have. Uh, I think two Americans in total, but the person did fill out a preferred gender of male. I mean, I give I give options. You can choose male, female, or that day you literally do not care. It's entirely up to you what you pick if you decide to fill out the form. It should be noted, of course, that the more specific criteria that you provide, the somewhat less likely it is that there will be somebody named after you particularly quickly. Uh, especially when it comes to potentially having multiple people named after you throughout the series. Because this will be a somewhat long-running series. It's not exactly a very short game. Well, at least, definitely not at the rate in which I record it. So, uh, that was my timer that went off right there at the end of the mission, which I'm actually surprised it only went off right then. We'll go ahead and wait for the new person to arrive in the North Africa base. And then we'll end this video. Oh, but first things first. Ground attack mission. I'm pretty friendly with one of the junior researchers at R&D. The seniors don't have time for us grunts. And she told me that they had identified over 3,500 separate alien craft orbiting our world. If they all landed tomorrow, we'd be dead. As it is, the ETs have merely committed to the largest air war since Hitler was in power. Pattern analysis of ET airstrikes suggests they are currently focusing on soft targets, highways, small towns, even isolated warships on patrol. These targets are difficult for emergency services to respond to, and the ET's ability to strike and retreat anywhere makes it impossible for local forces concentrated nearer the larger population centers to intercept. 
Ground attack missions can be carried out by any grade of signal from the smallest to the largest. Rather than being given a specific target, UFOs will patrol a patch of the planet looking for targets of opportunity. UFOs tasked with a ground attack mission will strike several times before retreating to rearm and refuel and can cause serious havoc. They're damned clever, Commander. They strike at locations that make no immediate military or economic impact, but they whittle away at our confidence and cut lines of commerce and communication. If we become isolated, the planet will shut down as effectively as if they had bombed every capital into rubble. Our experience and detection tech gives us a fighting chance against ET strikes. But the fact is, there are too many of them, and too few of us to handle them all at once. My advice is to get as many bases built as you can, never mind R&Ds bleeding for more funds. Those nerds have no idea how the real world works, and we need boots on the ground, not heads in the sky. Andron Disassembly Androns are bipedal robotic infantry. They stand approximately 2 meters, 6 feet, 7 inches tall, and are constructed from the same alien materials as the hulls of alien craft. They are heavily armored, utterly fearless, and capable of firing heavy weapons on the move, but seemingly suffer from a lack of situational awareness. Combat videos do not show a single instance of an Andron taking cover. Perhaps the aliens believe their robotic guardians invulnerable to our weapons? Either way, you should exploit this, fall, this flaw in their programming. The technology used in the recovered Andron is at once simple and complex. The design is elegant, and a lenium reactor is mounted within an armored component in the droid's torso, and uses a branching cable running down the back of the torso to distribute power to the rest of the body. Each joint contains an array of powerful hydraulics and servo motors, allowing fine control of each of the droid's robotic limbs. Though alien materials may make this design more effective than anything we could create, the basic mechanical setup could be replicated using human technology without enormous difficulty. What human technology could never replicate is a complex network of sensors that fill almost every spare inch of the droid's internal space. We cannot even identify many of the instruments, but their collective role is obvious, recording data on the droid's surroundings and feeding it to the processing units encased in its metal skull. While it is an extremely effective combat unit, we have genuine questions why the Andron exists at all. The parallels with organic life are obvious and clearly deliberate. It has a reactor placed where a living creature would have a heart, an electronic brain inside its armored head, even a power distribution system that mirrors the nervous system of a living creature. I see no compelling reason to build a bipedal combat robot at all. A wheeled or track design would be more stable, faster moving, better protected, and present a smaller battlefield target. Is it vanity? Stupidity? A puzzling, to say the least. Light Drone Wreck. There are, I believe, three different versions of this drone. The Light Drone, which we have here, a larger one, and then I think even an, another even larger one. The light drone is a small saucer-shaped drone approximately 140 centimeters wide with a thruster array mounted on the rear of the saucer and sensors and weaponry on the front. It is capable of hovering, but is usually sighted skimming the battlefield roughly a meter above the ground. This allows it to move freely over small obstacles or otherwise impassable terrain, such as water. Disassembly of recovered wreckage suggests that the heart of the drone is an alenium reactor no larger than a man's fist. We assume the mass of alien circuitry that surrounds it is in fact the drone's electronic brain. The lack of any visible receiver antenna suggests that these units are fairly autonomous or are fully autonomous when operational. An engine array on the rear of the drone provides forward motion, while the hover effect and probably pitch and roll is generated by the dozen small thrusters that dot the underside of the drone. The frontal part of the saucer is filled with a powerful scanner that can monitor almost the entire electromagnetic spectrum, giving these drones excellent sight ranges. The drone is armed with an unusual integrated weapon we dubbed the Burst Cannon. The Plasma Generation Array has been designed to emphasize rate of fire above all else, allowing it to fire extremely quickly, but leaving it underpowered even compared to the Plasma Pistol. A single shot would probably not even kill an unarmored 
civilian, as the shell of the drone itself is also not even thick enough to resist sustained small arms fire, I suspect these units are disposable scout units, primarily designed to locate and suppress enemies in the accompanying or so the accompanying aliens can deal with them more easily. A support role, rather than a hunter-killer role, it seems. Oh, this guy is taking forever to arrive. The Corvette is a medium-sized UFO. It is the first genuine alien warship we have encountered, exchanging the delicate wing surfaces used by smaller UFOs as sensor amplifiers for sturdier hull construction and more powerful weapons. The armor plating on this craft is the same stuff as the lighter UFOs, but applied in greater quantities, adding enormous survivability at the cost of greatly increased weight. The engines mounted in the rear of the vessel are enough to keep it airborne, but it is slow and ponderous compared to the lighter craft that precede it, and therefore vulnerable to heavy torpedoes. The power requirements to, of these engines necessi eh, necessitate both a second power core and an improved method of power transmission. The hull electronics are much more advanced than previously, so we have extracted them for further study. The primary armament of the Corvette is a forward-firing heavy plasma cannon. This has a slow rate of fire, but generates a powerful explosive projectile that is just as deadly when used to bomb ground targets as it is when used against aerial opponents. These projectiles travel relatively slowly, and you may find that our more agile interceptors are able to avoid them with an evasive roll maneuver, but they will inflict heavy damage on anything they hit. Be very careful about flying your interceptors into its firing arcs. Which is why we won't. There we go, he finally arrived. No, let's go ahead and just let the month take over. Um, I think it's another Russian that we got. So, let's see. Did anybody leave? Nope. Uh, but, yeah, funding ain't doing so hot. Especially in the, uh... Asia regions, but uh, Africa and the Americas are doing relatively well, with the exception of North America. It ain't that great, but it'll get better. You know, we only just this month got our Cuba base fully up and operational. You know, with a team that sucks, but they got a team. They have condors so they can take care of these smaller craft without too much of a hassle. Uh, a Corvette they would struggle with. We're going to have to go ahead and play, you know, uh, uh, cat and mouse with one of the Condors focusing on running away while another one comes up the rear and just fires torpedoes and uh, I assume we're basically using a Vulcan uh, cannon rounds up the backside. So, yeah, uh, we didn't, we lost quite a bit of money. Uh, basically, like I said, basically everybody went down except North America, South America, and Central America. But nobody left. We're just gonna have to do a lot better this next month, basically, to more or less ensure that nobody leaves. Uh, as far as I know, there is no way to get countries back if they leave. And if five funding regions leave, you lose the game. So, we have $848,000 left over after paying for maintenance. Like I said, we're going to have to do better. Luckily, it should be noted that that is money that we can spend to get the Jackal armor up, and we can sell excess Jackal armor off, so it's not going to hurt us too badly. And actually, no, it would be Antonia who, was, who came, because she's the only one that doesn't have armor. Um, either way, whatever. Uh, but yeah, so we have four Jackal armor. I need six more. So that I can ship it over here to the Cuba base. So that they can all get their Jackal armor. And then every excess Jackal armor we produce can just be sold. Uh, Jackal armor does not get destroyed when a soldier wearing it dies were apparently able to very easily, I guess, 
patch up the damage of somebody getting a plasma bolt through the chest. I assume that's how that works. Because we don't need to actually replace jackal armor as far as I can tell. So, six more of those. Um, I... I think I'm going to go ahead and use this money we got. And blow it on some more engineers. So next time, we'll have 15 extra engineers to help us with getting jackal armor out a little bit faster. Because it's obviously right now, it'll take us... 111 days and 5 hours to get the rest of the 99 that I ordered out. So that's going to be a little while. That is going to be a little while. Actually, I have 15 out of 99, but I only have 4 left over, and I only have 10 people at this base. Is the 15 out of 99 counting the one that's being produced right now? Is that how it works? Because I sh Oh no, I think we sold one off. Never mind, yes. We sold one off to cover the cost of finishing production on the Foxtrot so we could ship it to Cuba. So never mind. Everything adds up. We have produced 15, we sold one to get a little bit of money, and we have 14 that are either actively equipped to people or can be equipped to people. So next time, hopefully we'll finish off an, the jackal armor that's necessary for the B team. We'll ship it over to them, and then they'll get all the fancy schmancy gear that uh, the A team has, just without all the experience that the A team has. So, I mean, it works, I guess. Just, yeah, it's not as great as it could be. Um... Realistically, I will probably build these missile batteries, just not right now. Money is still a little hard to come by, so we're going to hold off on that because it's 50000 each. Um, and that's an 11000 upkeep, and missile batteries themselves aren't the greatest. Uh, once we research better techs, we'll get better defensive batteries, and those are better. I can only build a maximum of three of those here at this base. Because we need a spare space open for a tech that we're going to get down the road. That is very nice. And actually, that's going to be the case with most of our bases. If they get fully kitted out like our starting base, they're only going to be allowed to have three defensive batteries. I don't see the other bases getting that though, so the secondary bases will probably have a lot more defensive batteries. So... We're going to be relying on the A team for defending this base if it ever gets attacked, but the other places, those defensive batteries should do a decent job. Let's go ahead and end this part here. I will see you all next time. A quick reminder that I do have a Patreon and a Streamlabs donation link down below in the description if you wish to support the channel. Those are the two best ways to do it. If you don't wish to support the channel, that's fine. It's entirely up to you, but it is appreciated. Allows me to be able to, you know, easily afford, or well, more easily afford rather, uh, buying games, upgrading my computer, whatever the case may be. Uh, so it's entirely up to you if you want to support the channel. It is appreciated if you do choose to do so, of course, however. Also down there is a link to my Discord server. That is my go-to place for posting about channel happenings. So if you want to know what's going on with the channel, if there's changes in my recording or streaming schedules, um, namely, for example, something comes up that just makes it so I'm not in the mood to do it or something comes up that just prevents me from doing it because I don't know maybe I don't have access to my computer or, or whatever the case may be so I do recommend joining that you don't have to be active if you don't wish to I'm not active in most of the servers I'm a part of I'm mostly there just to get the news about anything that's going on with channels and whatnot that I follow but generally speaking I don't really interact much on most servers that I'm in. But yeah, so that'll be it for this part. I will see you all next time. Until then, goodbye and farewell.